Okay. All right. All right, welcome everybody to our Bluesy Water channel. Today we're discussing photobiomodulation and we have one of the experts in the field. I'm sorry, Dr. Prashad, what's your last name? Farsad. Prashad, okay. He's an expert in photobiomodulation. He's from Iran. So this is the miracle of uh, being able to talk to everybody all over the world. We have Dr. Joe D'Addario, who is the inventor of the Pro Neurolight photobiomodulation device. And Dr. Joe works with Prasad as his main researcher. So we wanted to you know, get some uh, more in-depth information on photobiomodulation. There's uh, some stuff on the internet, but uh, we're really privileged to have an expert in the field. So first, uh, could you just introduce yourself and how you came into doing the work, you know, the work with photobiomodulation? All right, I'm Farzad Salehpur. I'm from Iran. And I have a Master of Science in Medical Physicist with a specialty in photobiomodulation for brain application. I've done a lot of research regarding procognitive and antidepressant-like effects of low-level laser light in animal rodent models. And we had a couple of the human application of the photobiomodulation during the past two years on the, some of the, you know, dementia patients and for cognitive enhancement in healthy young adults. Great. That was a recent paper that just came out. Prasad uh, uh, and I started our collaboration. Oh, 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 well, it's going to, it's uh, me, me, oh, well, years ago, basically, uh, he came out with the Brain Narrative Review of Photobiomodulation, which actually escalated him to a expert in the field. And so I thought it would be uh, very interesting to, you know, share some of my perspectives being a manufacturer and a clinical researcher. Uh, so that's where our collaboration began. And we wrote a uh, case report on a client who had, had a rapid re uh, reversal of cognitive decline. So we had the data, and I and uh, uh, Fasad and I collaborated to put the paper together. So we showed within 28 days a six. A, what was 57 year old? Uh, 57. I think she was 57. Fasad 63. Yeah, 65, 63, yeah. 63 year old. She had seven years. She'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she went from Alzheimer's to normal in 28 days. This was a combination of transcranial therapy with a helmet that I invented, intranasal therapy that Lou Lim invented, and uh, the Violite, and then a body pad that we put onto the person. So not only did we see a global score that they changed in their MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, from Alzheimer's to normal in 28 days, their working memory improved, I think it was 130%. Uh, caregiver stress was reduced. She actually returned to normal in her activities of daily living. And for the first time really documented, we had a return of smell. So the smell returned from uh, ad nausea, which means she couldn't smell, ad nausea, I think that's what it's called, to a baseline normal for a dementia patient, which had never been demonstrated before. So we were very excited about that result and we continue our collaboration because we work well together. Great. Um, so you said you used the intranasal, the helmet, and a pad? Uh, it, it was a uh, blood, brain, body. So when we're looking at someone in the throes or in the depths of uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, we know that there's an uh, inflammatory reaction and recovery in their brain. And our theory was, at least clinically, was that if you're going to send light energy into the brain and start to change the brain, well, if you're detoxing the brain or releasing tau proteins or cutting up whatever, whatever's happening in there, 
perhaps it would be a good idea to make sure that the body has the ability to move those waste products out. You know, when you're sleeping and the lymph and everything like that. So we put the body pad on for two reasons. One, to help to flow of the lymph and the increased circulation in these areas, but also for pain, pain relief, and even for the caregivers, because we recommended that the caregivers use the pads also do the program because they're the ones that are the most stressed. They are the ones that are in the most pain. Those are the ones that are doing all the work, really. So uh, it was quite a unique approach. Uh, we call it multimodal, right, Prasad? Yes, yes. And that's multimodal. Uh, same, the pad is uh, infrared pad. Red and infrared pad, the same similar wavelengths. Yep. Okay. Okay. So. That makes total sense. Uh, if you're detoxing any part of the body, you need to have a global support system for the detox. We didn't find that if you did one, uh, you know what I'm saying, if you, we did one thing like a little light up the nose, that you're going to have a global change. You know, we have a theory that we're actually going forward with about, you know, you know, light energy or photobiomodulation is is, is not like a vitamin. It's not like a supplement that you got to take a little bit, a little bit here and a little bit there. We're trying to think of it more as a food, as calories. So, you know, it's like the more, if you want to gain muscle, you got to eat more food. You know, to have an effect, you need a certain dose. And that's really why you know, all of the medical physicists and, and everything and all the parameters, that's really Fazad's most magnificent uh, expertise as well as his, you know, clinical uh, work and work in the animal model, which he is, you know, world renowned for. Uh, but the, you know, it gets complicated when you're dealing with, you know, all these different parameters. Right, and I mean, people spend so much time indoors and they're not exposed to natural light. Uh, like they used to be working out in the fields. Most people were outdoors working for large, and then one could argue that even the uh, well, the uh, the light waves aren't the same as it used to be due to the uh, pollution and uh, sky is definitely altered. The blue light toxicity of the artificial lights being inside, of course. So. You know, that's really what we started to do is come up with a different protocol, a different instrument that, uh, you know, have been helping people across the world, really. Um, do, you have, do you have a helmet nearby that you could show the audience? Uh-huh. Uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, I'll go get it. Okay. So this helmet has two bands of frequency, infrared, Prasad and uh, near infrared, correct? It's red and near infrared. Red one, 633 nanometer, and near infrared one, 810 nanometer. And which one is more for circulation? It depends on the, you know, the cytochrome C oxidase, you know, absorption spectra believes that the near infrared one has the you know higher highest absorption you know and but the red one is best in the second you know the, in the ranking I, I, yeah so you provide both so if someone had i mean in terms of um i just want to show you, here's the helmet okay it's been a while uh since Prasad was able to See, this is completely portable. We use it with my brain matters. It has like how many lights all together in there? I think we said uh, 288. I believe so. We don't have the paper in front of us. Okay. This is how I do my uh, Instagram channel. My Brain Matters, and my Facebook. Get my transcranial photobiomodulation on and do my research in the morning and then a little bit in the evening to 
increase the circulation in my brain for the glymphatic drainage. So that's really part of my uh, program right there. These are individually uh, able to be turned on and off because you know, we're trying to use further testing to find out, let's just say you're dealing with someone with uh, uh, traumatic brain injury and they have an injury to the right side of their brain. Well, perhaps it's best that, you know, we're, if we just treat the right side of the brain and the top of the brain. Uh, so this is the, gives us the ability to direct this light therapy where in the direction and area that we want. You can also flip it around, correct? Well, I think that there's a, a, a you know, Fasad and I are really going back and forth on specific areas of brain enhancement. Most of the people who are using high powered lasers are using them on spot areas, you know, or a band of cross like this. So, you know, there's, this is pancranial, so it's going across the whole brain. So I say, you know, think of it this way, feeding the whole brain or en enhancing the extent that we understand the whole brain. We would assume that, right, Facade? We can't tell this little light right here how much of this photon of light is going to go in and touch my temporal zone or my eye. We really can't measure that now. Is that correct, Facade? You can just theorize. Yes, just, you know, it estimates some of the, you know, the, I mean, important parts of the uh, skull. For example, the four frontal, frontal regions, four parietal, I mean, temporal and occipital, because we just paint cranial radiation. Uh, this is our methods. But for frontal region, uh, most of the papers reported that about the six, up to 8% of the near-infrared laser light or LEDs and 810 nanometer, 830 nanometer could reach to the cortical surface. But for red one, 630 nanometer up to 670 nanometer, the, about the, you know, 3 to 5% of the initial, you know, photons could reach the cortical surface. So this is enough for, you know, delivering some of the photons using, I don't know, 10 minutes, 50 minutes to delivering some of the optimum and the therapeutic range of the and light dosage to cortical neurons for achieving the better results. So to summarize, to summarize, to correct me if I'm wrong, for the infrared light, that we're using, and that's a general, let somebody look that up, the wavelength. We can get six to eight percent to the cortical level. And for the red light, you said we may be able to get five percent to the cortical level? Yes, yes, this is different from the skull from skull the adults and the skull from the patients with the you know highest age. This is this is the relatively, but the up to five, four percent has been reported in the literature. So, I mean, think about it this way. If you can get, let's just say for a round figure, 5% of the light energy from your outside to the inside, why would you just do one point like this? Does it make any sense? I mean, really? If you, if you have to use a point, let's say, if you had to kill a, if you have to kill a charging elephant, you, would you rather blow him up globally or try to hit one spot with one laser bullet. I think that that's one of the problems with laser therapies or spot therapy versus a global therapy is that you better hit the right spot. And then you better know what that action is going to happen once you reach there. Is it stimulatory? Is it high enough to be inhibitory? How is that going to affect the rest of the person? So, you know, I think that you, you, that I'm trying to, you know, as a clinician, first do no harm. So a, you know, this is probably like, you could sit in the sun or being outside. This is feeding the brain on the whole head, just like you would be if you were standing outside, maybe, right? It's one way to think of it. 
you know, you're right about this, but laser therapy scientists, mostly psychiatrists, use the FP1, FP2, and F3, F4 EG spots because those are involved in the, some of the high order cognitive, I mean, the functions. In, and in terms of the depression, FP1 and FP, FP2 has a role in the, some of the, I mean, the reward, reward pathways. So, but for the Alzheimer, because of the, the pathophysiology of the, a lot of several, you know, the regions in interhenal cortex, hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, or orbitofrontal cortex, and in some of the stages, later stages, the parietal cortex, we just recommend the whole brain therapy using near infrared laser plus red one. So, and here's the thing that I want to share with you. This is the just static, static organ stimulation. When we use the transcranial one, we just put laser to the brain, static brain, the tissue. But for some of the dy dynamic, you know, organs like, like the blood, we use the, some of the intranasal and then also, we use the body path for circulation. Again, just the abscopal effect, indirect. Abscopal is indirect. So what he's saying is that when we looked at the brain and we looked at the treatment of photons, so you have photons of energy. So like, like Paulo Cassano says, light brings energy into the body. So light transforms the cell. Light comes into the cell. So when we looked at it, we have, you know, putting light on my head at this point. So it, what is being, what is accepting that light? What could possibly be hit? We talked about that it's going to go to the cortex, but I have skin, I have blood vessels, I have bone, right? I have you know, cerebral spinal fluid, and I have cortex. So some of the tissue is static. My bone of my brain, of my skull, is just sitting there. So is my brain. So it can't move if the light is hitting it. So I can, have, I can maybe go too much to that area. I can burn my skin. Or I can uh, maybe heat up my bone if I had high power. Because that cannot move. It's static. And it must accept that charge and the power that's coming to it. The dynamic tissues are more mobile. They're underneath. They're the river where the light comes, not the stone. So they can accept that light and diffuse the heat, if you will, or diffuse some of that energy, if you will. And as we postulated in our upcoming intranasal um, narrative review, that there's a huge amount of benefit in things that are not really it's just static a little bit harder to study and maybe comprehend because it's a three-dimensional multi you know modal brain you know human it's not just well let's take a biopsy of this tissue here where the light hit it or let's look what happened to this place where the light hit it that's adequate but it's not a global it's perhaps not you know it's perhaps not how everything works let me um, just focus in the neurons themselves in the brain. This, so you're talking 5% delivery. How does it affect the, the neuronal recovery? If there's neur neuron damage, <laughs> sheath damage, obviously the neurons are a huge. The, the, to me, you know, the brain is 60, they say 60% fat. The brain requires insulation. Um, there's a very delicate balance in there, you know, hyper excitability in the brain. We, I sometimes speculate would be not enough coating of myelin sheath around the neurons. Anyhow, it's obviously quite intricate, but does, does the photobiomodulation repair damaged neurons? Farzad, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, okay. You know, the, the ac main action mechanisms of the photobiomodulation is based on the stimulation, biostimulation of the mitochondria. 
and fourth enzymatic uh, the complexes. So the the block with this you know action mechanism, some of the ion channel stimulating and some of the uh, other you know neuroinflammation and the apoptotic, the secondary mechanisms have been put forward. The real thing is if we just you know deliver amount of about one, two, five, six joule per centimeter square to neurons, mitochondria will be will be boost in terms of ATP production. And then we just, you know, some of the signal secondary signaling pathway will be, you know, activated and the transcript transcription factors and then some of the I mean the long lasting terms of the action mechanism like the I don't know neurogenesis is in the synaptogenesis is and these kinds of processes so the one to five six joule per centimeter square at the cortical levels is a key is a key for yeah for achieving the the therapeutic benefits so what if we, if i could just interject you asked for zod can it regenerate nerves and his response was if you give it the right amount of joules or juice, it will respond. And I would like to interject and state that for the past 10 years, we have been using this exact wavelength and frequencies to regenerate nerves in the peripheral nervous system. We have, we have documented this over three times, that putting this consistency of continuous wave light, red and infrared on the feet, and hands of people with peripheral neuropathy that they will regrow the nerves, reestablish balance, reestablish sensibility, have a reduction in pain. This has been done over and over in from my research and in the literature. At that point, I always said, if I can regrow the nerves of the feet, why can't I regrow the nerves of the brain? And I had enough courage after I worked with Facade in his research, that we could use these frequencies and this power for the brain. As a matter of fact, how else can someone get their memory back, Fajad? How else can someone get their smell back? How else can someone get their uh, ability to do their tasks, their daily tasks? So again, think back 10 years ago, when I put these lights on patients' feet, and they said, I can feel the hot and cold now. I can feel the carpet. I can feel the, the water as it hits my foot. You ask yourself, well, did, how did that sensation come back if the nerves did not regrow? That was unheard of 10 years ago to say that ner peripheral nerves could regrow. Yet we have evidence of it. We have intraepidermal nerve fiber density showing that the nerves actually grew back. In theory, that's what happened. But the data was difficult to present to people whose whole life has been nerves don't regrow. But we know synaptogenesis, growing more synapses, and actually growing more nerves, and growing more mitochondria, and stronger mitochondria, and increasing their ability to transport and function and give energy makes more brain power. Okay, and I just want to support that statement just from my own clinical work yes number one obviously the body can rejuvenate we're in the infancy of time where uh, what's impossible is becoming possible there's a doctor out of china who was able to grow back a severed finger um became famous in the u.s repaired burn severe damaged burn patients so we know this is possible uh it's going to become much more the ability to, to, to repair tremendous levels of damage is, is just in the infancy stage. I guess my only question with the light therapy, so it is used for repairing uh, brain damage. So how does the light get into the deeper sections of the brain? Very good question. Very good question. So if I could just pop onto one thing that Fazad is talking about, when we say abscopal effect, that's like a buzzword in our, in our science, that's off target. So when we talk about affecting deeper tissue in the brain, 
we know that it's only going to really touch the the the, the 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 surface of the cortex correct not the gray matter but yet people can have it the hippocampus is deep which we can actually reach through the nose and if you know we get into some of the deeper areas facade has done some research and explained that if you do it in the mouth to the back you can reach the midbrain for parkinson's people uh, but let's just talk about a second that uh uh you know when brain cells die you lose the synapses you, you lose the communication and you know in the peripheral nervous system every nerve makes a specific protein for the muscle that it's attached to did you know that they're married together so if a nerve doesn't fire or does it work or hasn't able to transport, it cannot deliver those proteins, those amino acids specifically downstream to the muscle. So perhaps in the deep structures of the brain where we, we presume based on our calculations that this superficial light is not going to reach deep, deep into the brain. Perhaps there is a neurologic light that goes on here that allows the light to go on a different place because the brain is all connected perhaps it's a signal that this one's alive that allows this one to become alive based on its neurologic connections perhaps it's because the blood can penetrate deep into the tissue that we are invigorating or illuminating or irradiating Perhaps these photons do pass deeper than we know. The point I'm trying to make is there is significant evidence out there now that deep structures in the brain are able to be changed by superficial applications of light. Right. Not to pass it to Prasad. Just let, let Prasad speak on this because he's very, very, very expert in this part that we're talking about. And yeah, about the indirect or systemic or apscopal effects. There is a lot of, you know, research conducted by the remote tissue photobiomodulation by the Australian, as I mentioned, Parkinson disease application, you know, the groups. So they use just the illumination of the, the just brain versus the body application. They, they, one, of, one of the groups of the animals received the transcranial laser Red one, yeah, 670 nanometer LEDs. I'm sorry, LEDs radiation. And another group received the body radiation with the, with the same wavelength. So the results were a little bit, you know, similar in terms of the do, dopaminergic, do, dopaminergic, you know, the neurons flows. So let me explain that study so that they can understand it. They took mice. On some of them, they gave them the brain light. On some of them, they gave them the body light and covered the skull so that they could not get any light into the past into the skull. And what was their study on? Was it depression or brain function? What did they study these things on? It was the Parkinson's disease. So they gave the mice the Parkinson's and then they gave them body or brain exclusively and both of the Parkinson's mice got better. So, again, you talk about neuronal repair deep in the brain. I don't think it has to be, I don't think you have to hit it with the laser beam as perhaps your magic bullet theory brain was thinking about, Andrew. I don't know what you were going with that, but the point is, yes, there's evidence that you can change deep structures in the brain with light therapy. Right, there is, there is um, I guess, you know, I mean, from my point of view as a body worker, I, I understand the uniformity of, uh, you know, you're all, if, if there's a stuck area, let's say, let, let's say as a chiropractor, you know, you're going to, you want to release uh, L5, you might take a towel and pull the head to get down to L5. In other words, um, 
Yeah. Every every part affects another part. You can't have like your cervical if your cervicals are completely jammed up, it's going to affect the brain because it's going to be the energy is not going to be able to flow. So obviously the the quality of the energy throughout the body is critical, and light obviously, as you said, is a food. So when the body starts to receive light, that is a fundamental frequency that you would say is in the the healing. Uh, it's profoundly sound and light are one of the most critical factors in healing. So, yeah, and I also have thought of photobiomodulation when you're coming from the surface, almost like a soaker hose effect. If you put a soaker hose on soil, oh. it, it'll work itself down. That's an, that, and that is an amazing uh, theory that they're putting forward uh, from Praveen's lab on how this dose works. Again, it's, you have to take in both the dynamic, right? The super soaker is kind of the same thing because if you're soaking the, the, the earth with water, and so slowly it saturates until it can't hold anymore. Now that is based on some theory that the mitochondria, you know, will be able to accept a certain amount of energy, and then after that, they don't really accept it anymore. So where does it go? Where is it leaked? That's the that's the problem. So how long does it take to fill the bucket? But you speak speak for a second and tell Prasad your experience using the helmet because you you are use the via light intranasal first, if I'm not mistaken. Then you use the via light helmet. I stated that you know being a body worker and you know working on these similar areas you were able to use the pro neural light helmet for the past over a little bit over a month i really would like for you to share with facade your insights and your perspective on what you felt and what you noticed go ahead well yeah i use a lot of protocols i've been using um I was using the Noro, the Alpha Noro from v -Lite. So I do like the intranasal. Um, Joe sent me his unit to, to try. I um, started using that with the intranasal. I found that after a while, I didn't need to use the intranasal quite as often. Um, I do use a lot of other therapies also. Uh, my, the other thing I do is ear insufflation ozone. And uh, I use a uh, pulsed electromagnetic frequency heavy duty applicator. And, and then I've used some cranial electrotherapy stimulation. But my favorites are, yeah, wear the helmet and then the PMF therapy. Now with the PMF therapy, I've been able to repair very severe compromise, broken bones, damage, all kinds of injury repair. So I think sat, the sound, well, PMF is magnetic. Anything that can get to the cellular level deep, I'm a real proponent of. Um, and I do, yeah, this whole thing of, particularly talking about depression, the cell literally, if it can, if the cells can have light, the frequency of light, that's the, anti, that's the antithesis of depression. I mean, anybody who, as depression, you know, if they could get light deep into the brain, it's just common sense to me. So uh, I think that's a huge, and dementia too. The brain is just, you know, light is intelligence for the, for the, for the brain and it's organizational. So I'm, I'm, I think, you know, if one consistently uses the uh, photobiomodulation, like I say, with some adjunct therapies that I also recommend, I think you can get incredible results. Did you notice any, my question more specifically, Andrew, was what did you notice about having a 42 times stronger helmet on your head? I was saying I backed off on, uh, I didn't need to use the intranasal as much. So I was using the Noro. Uh, Pro Noro light helmet. Yeah, it only has what, four lights, I think. One, two, yeah, four lights, I believe. Four lights. That go on and off. So definitely the uh, 
the helmet that you have is way more saturating. Uh, it's, you can also, I, I wear it sometimes 25, 30, 40, even longer. It, it's gentle in a way, but very, very saturating. And, and I've flipped it around. And the main thing I noticed is I could flip it around and put it on the frontal bone and, and not need sense that I need the intranasal uh, to use it. I'm using the intranasal a lot less. Now, I, I, as I talk to my audience, you know, you know, I use a pendulum and I douse. Should I do this? Should I do that? Um, but I do notice that I am using the intranasal less and less as I use the helmet. Now, if somebody has severe compromise, I would think you would want to get on the intranasal along with the helmet. But I think once you uh, start to heal and balance, I think you could probably back off of the intranasal would be my guess. Well, I think that uh, the way that we're looking clinically from the people that, at least that I'm speaking with, Prasad, you can comment if you choose, that really the infrared intranasal piece is really, we really don't know too much about that. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen when you put the infrared intranasal to the tissues, except, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, hasn't really been studied by itself. Am I correct, Prasad? Yes. But the red light in the nose intranasally is going to give you a benefit that we've kind of figured out as far as the blood so i think that once we have a chance to have our intranasal review published might be a good time to come on and review what happens when we put light into the nose the nasal cavity and the and uh, some of the the ability of it to uh, address stem cell production uh, at neuroregenesis, you know, so nerve stem cells, right? Regular stem cells, uh, blood uh, and changes in the blood and its ability for its viscosity. And the point is that perhaps that is a straight line to maybe even hit our prefrontal cortex, which is the part that you know, Fazad is very, very astute on as far as the antidepressant, mood, cognition, you know, processing. You know, the part that makes you human is right here, the prefrontal cortex. So I would suggest that, uh, I know I don't use them simultaneously. I use mine, uh, my intranasal, you know, before, for about an hour before I use my transcranium. Oh, that's interesting. I don't put them together because, I, you know, I want to have the body's ability to hit it and then quit it and then recover. I also, uh, I want to ask you about the, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pineal gland, the amygdala. These are critical uh, centers in the the glandular system, obviously, the pituitary hypothalamus connection, the pineal gland is associated in many traditions with a higher consciousness. You know, if you couldn't get that, they some people talk about decalcifying the pineal gland. Obviously, the pineal gland, pituitary hypothalamus, and then the amygdala has a lot to do with trauma, uh, PTSD, which photobiomodulation has been used with. So how does it affect the, the pituitary, the pineal, the amygdala, and the um, hypothalamus? Have you seen studies on that? Yeah. Um, if you want to, you know, uh, try with the, the human subjects, intranasal road could be the candidate for the future, you know, the, I mean, the first in terms of the implanted deep, intranasal photobiomodulation stuff. At the literature, we, we saw a couple of their evidence, such as the implant implantation of the uh, light optical fibers in the vicinity of the cribriform plate, and also in this sphenoid sinus for delivering more light into the 
substantia nigra, the amygdala, hippocampus, etc. But for the cariporiform plate irradiation, olfactory bulb, they received a lot of, you know, the sufficient light dosage. But these are, you know, the hypothetical and just in the simulation modeling, optical simulation modeling evidence, and also in one, you know, the human in cadaver. In, is, am, I, am I right? Cadaver. Cadaver, yeah. Cadaver experiment, experiments showed that in the intranas deep, deep intranasal for biomodulation uh, has a great potential for elimination, sufficient elimination of the substantia nigra. In, which, which is a you know the, the involvement Parkinson. in the Parkinson's. Parkinson's. So what he's saying is that there's there's a trickle of evidence, and I think that if you look at even the traumatic brain injury, the PTSD literature, and the recent one by Hipskin and his group, they show changes in the basal ganglia with a superficial treatment. You know, I believe that the spec scan imaging was able to show deep brain changes. So again, are these clinically directed? Here's what I'm trying to say. Are these a, an off-target effect, something that happens, or are these directed? These are not clinically directed. You are not sending a laser beam of light that's doing this. Right, right, right. <laughs> We, uh, we in, that, in, that, in that factor, you have a risk, in my opinion. What are you doing if it's not your target? If you don't have the ability to influence it directly, then you your outcome is determined by so many other factors. You probably let me, let me just clarify I think what you're saying you're saying if you deliver the therapy to the whole system and, and homeostasis let the system work itself out and heal as opposed to trying to target because if you target one area you're not feeding the whole brain you know you got one area what about the rest of the it's, it's like an imbalance so you're trying to give feed the body the light to allow it to work itself out in essence so what about again I want to ask because of the gland me, hold that question hold that question but what I'm trying to say is this the question that you answered that you asked that we are answering may be the kind of the wrong question in the sense that if I'm turning on the brain with the light therapy am I also having turning on too much higher stimulated area. If I have a higher functioning amygdala, which is giving me a, a hypervigilance and a fear response and bad memories and everything like that, and I'm raising the entire level of the brain, is that going to make my already high processing amygdala kick in more? Clinically, we don't see that. Clinically, we see that you put that on the brain and everything sort of Works itself Auto adjusts. Right. right. I just want to point that out. But no, I hear you saying over, over and again, over and over again that this is food, critical food, and the brain is going to work itself out. So your contention is the hypothalamus, the pituitary, all the, the pineal, all that also will try to tend to come into balance. Correct. That's a theory. That's a hypothesis. Right, because obviously the relationship, let's say, the thyroid to the brain is known. If there's, if your low thyroid affects brain function, the pituitary affects the thyroid. Is there any, uh, since the thyroid is not too far from the helmet you're wearing, is there any, uh, would you say the, the light therapy is migrating down to the thyroid gland? And could you wear it, could you put it over the thyroid itself? Because that... Um, yeah, good point. Um, the, there is a, the, some of the, you know, concern, safety concern in the photobiomodulation for, in terms of the, because we use the laser, three, three, uh, I mean, class lasers and also the, the four in some of the recent, you know, studies, they use the four, fourth class laser light. 
So there's a some some sort of you know the healthcare and the the safety concern about the some organs like the thyroid and in the pregnancy you know situation. So maybe the putting the light body helmet or something in the around the I mean the mm, ca carotide right. So was that that's the carotids? Right here, right. here would be your thyroid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, maybe this needs uh, the, you know, some of the, I don't know, the in caution, you know. The, some caution. So he would yeah. say that Considering. sometimes that would be caution. But if you think about it, that's an excellent point that you bring up, Andrew. Not only are they using light pads, on the carotid arteries to increase circulation to the brain by creating vasodilation there that's an entire protocol where they because no one had built a helmet yet basically so they had pads so they put it here right you know, has, i don't believe it's been thought in thyroid function but increasing circulation to your thyroid is probably a good thing increase the circulation right here and you have a a huge stimulation of the baroreceptors and everything right in this area. This is a, a critical area for, for light therapy. And there's a lot and of light activity there. As a matter of fact, I personally, and Fasad has seen me do this, I used uh, my intranasal device right here and send the light right up the right and parallel with the carotid arteries. And, I, and, I, and I, you can feel it go boom, boom, boom. I mean, you feel it pulsing. You know, you, it's happening. You know, think about it. The, the, pituitary, the pituitary is the master gland. The thyroid's right under it, which is a huge gland for total body regulation. So, I mean, if you think just about the positioning, you want to definitely hit number one and number two. And they dramatically affect each other. So, thyroid's huge in brain function. Anybody who's hyperthyroid knows that. And yeah, so, um, okay. So yeah, just to, to restate what you're saying, if you feed the body this light therapy in a homeostasis approach, the whole, the whole head, you're allowing the body to work out its, in its own intelligence, use the light therapy to heal itself. And, uh, that's what, and there's enough evidence that photobiomodulation has worked with dementia, traumatic brain injury. It's definitely worth uh, using. I've used it. I, I have noticed improvement in uh, cognitive function, energy. Yeah, let's talk about So just indirectly, you know, when people think brain function, they do think neurotransmitters. Are there any studies in terms of improvement in dopamine, serotonin, you know, how to affect cortisol, et cetera, et cetera? Yep. Uh, actually, Prasad is. Can, can I tell him about your book that you're writing, Prasad? Or and yeah, actually, I'm these days. I'm busy with the the huge, you know, the project I call photobiomodulation for brain book. So I would like to, you know, they gather a lot of details and a lot of information physical information, the neurobiological information regarding the whole laser tissue interaction, laser neuron interaction, the all of the the brain conditions that have been you know studied during the past two decades in in, the, in terms of the photobiomodulation. So but in terms of the neuro, neurotransmitters, there's a couple of you know little evidence in, in the literature for the GABA, GABA region, what's that? Dopaminergic GABA, the serotonin, epinephrine, uh, in the in the animal models. In terms of the cort cortical levels, we in our laboratory showed that in depression animal models, red laser, 630 nanometer red laser could modulate the cortisol and decrease the cortisol, you know, serum cortisol levels. That's correct. And then, yeah, they then improve the anxious state and the depressive like Anxiousness, behavior. so red light given to animals 
allowed them to be less anxious and depressed by reducing their cortisol levels. And blood glucose. And it helped their blood glucose too, right? And the, so they affected the GABA, serotonin. That's a different study. That's a different study. Because yes. like, he, he spoke on all those things that you requested. And uh -huh. also, the, the most recently, the our laboratory showed that the near infrared one, 810 nanometer, with eight joule per centimeter square at cortical surface, could modulate the serotonin and nitric oxide. And then, you know, improve the, the mood states and the animal, again, depression models. So this is the first study that we showed that the, in the literature that the photobiomodulation could modulate the serotonin. You know, I mean, the, the, the cardinal neurotransmitters involved in the mood, mood disorders. Uh, another quick question. If somebody were to contact me, I mean, I, it's such a new field. I do work with people if they're looking for alternative models. Uh, I recommend the photobiomodulation plus some additional therapies. Are there any uh, doctors, psychiatrists, Joe? I mean, I, you're, I don't know if you work with people one on one. Who, if somebody wants to do this therapy with an integrated, with a practitioner that supports it, who do they call? Well, are they, are they on their own? Are they essentially? Well, you know, here's the key. Here's the key. That as Fazad keeps telling me over and over, this is a very new field. We don't have enough soldiers to do the research, and we really don't have as many soldiers to do the therapy. So really what we've created is a at-home system where you're just going to let your brain, give, feed the brain the light that it needs and see what happens. It's not the optimal, you know, it's not all the nutrients, it's not all the micro, but, but we're just gonna give you the food right now. Maybe the little bit of spice can come later. You know? So the point is that having the conversation with you andrew you're a practitioner you can lead these people other people who are interested in this can get with the program and learn some of the you know the facts and the science and the research about really what's happening you know people are taking little things like this and shining it on their heads and saying oh well we do laser therapy in our office Based on what? So yes, I would, answering my own question, we did create what's called the trauma release program, which includes this photobiomodulation. We advocate a synergy of very helpful practices. And we do find that if you integrate all these practices, you get great results. So photobiomodulation, uh, anybody who's losing cognitive function has depression, Anybody wants to heal their brain, balance their brain, it's a gentle, powerful therapy. I mean, that's funny saying gentle and powerful, but it works in a gentle way. Um, if you stay consistent with it, like all our other practices, you'll start to notice a lot of results. And as Joe mentioned, with that lady who, uh, my brain matters, you see? You see, it's all about that. My brain matters and people who want to get better need, they want more brain power. And my brain matters, and the point is you don't have to wait for some doctor to hold your hand. You just want your brain to get better. You want more brain power, and this is a way to do it. Right, and also, uh, now we advocate just to, um, depending on what, okay, so personally, if you integrate these therapies with meditative practices, you can get a... Uh, Let's just say we advocate a more spiritual intelligence. Uh, depends what type, what part of your brain you want to tap into, what type of practice you're looking towards. I mean, I actually, one little thing, I use that luminosity program and I'm functioning quite well on it. I hadn't used it in a couple of years. But we also do advocate what we call Hopa Onopono practice where you're tapping into the deeper subconscious memories and we believe that those memories which are hard to tap and very most of us suppress rob the brain of tremendous creativity and power 
So, you know, again, we, we advocate this as integrating with uh, spiritual practice and we, so take a look at our trauma release program and all, all the, that information. Um, trauma is really where this all starts to begin with. There's psychological trauma, physical stress trauma, living in this world trauma. You're from Iran, you know about trauma at, in that part of the world. Uh, so we're trying, you know, there's a lot of this research is around trauma. You know, now they call it uh, PTSD. In the old days, if you went to war, you know, you'd just be brave, come home and suck it up. That's right. <laughs> so now we, everyone's coming out, acknowledging trauma, even in schools. There are now trauma programs in schools. I would like to see photobiomodulation get into the classrooms with little kids. So hopefully this will become the new wave of healing. And so uh, any questions, yeah, contact me. We can get you a unit to heal your brain. Thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Any final, any final comments? Any final comments? Joe? Go ahead, Dr. Joe. Well, you know, I think that uh, coming from city, us sitting in three separate rooms in three different states, two different countries, to have that, someone have the vision of having these units inside the schools to keep people calm, to give them a boost in their cognition, allow them to have their brain in a safe you know like you said gentle but powerful environment i think that that's a beautiful thought andrew and i i, I thank you for sharing that with us thank you andrew. yeah thanks and thank you for your research we need it we need it we appreciate it so much that's what we need we all need more brain nice. power baby yeah. thank you <laughs> good that you're in that field Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. All righty, everybody. Take care.